Please welcome Mark Masika Miller. Good evening. So I'm, I'm, I'm borrowing my wife's laptop, so I'm grateful that I was able to successfully log in. Uh, but anyway, it's so good to see everyone. Uh, what a great turnout. Thank you, Kersha, for your wonderful introduction and sort of background information. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, just uh, a heads up here on my presentation. I am the chair of the Friends of the Rail and Trail. I've been thinking about rail and trail for a number of years. This presentation is going to talk about the trail, and it's going to talk about rail along the corridor. So when you hear that, I want you to pretend like what you're really hearing is it could be bus rapid transit, it could be personal rapid transit, it could be some other form of public transit. There's a study underway, and uh, what we end up with is up in the air. But, uh, so I just want to let you know that's where I'm coming from. Um, but let's see what happens. Any other housekeeping? I think that's it. So where's the rail corridor? Um, not everyone knows. It extends from Davenport up in the north. Uh, it winds along the, winds along the coast. We go through Santa Cruz, Live Oak, Capitola, Soquel. Have to Lasella Beach and down to Watsonville. What some people don't know is that that corridor is within one mile of half of the county's population. It's within one mile of 92 parks and 44 schools. It is goes through the heart of, of our county. So what we're going to talk about tonight is not really the railing trail. What we're going to talk about is what, what are the challenges facing our community? What are the transportation challenges facing our community? How do we build uh, solutions to that problem? How do we do it in, a, in an environmentally sustainable way? How do we do that in a way that honors social equity? So we, we all experience traffic. We, I don't know where you came from tonight. I noticed traffic was a little light tonight. I was grateful. But uh, people spend an hour in traffic, an hour and a half in traffic sometimes. It take, it's taking longer and longer to get around. Highway 1 is jammed. Our surface streets are jammed. Even our neighborhood streets are becoming jammed with you know, the new uh, wayfinding apps that wind you through residential streets. So we have a problem. I think we need a plan to solve that problem. And that plan involves transit options for everybody. No matter the weather, how old you are, young you are, whether you're able-bodied or not, uh, whatever your health is, whether you're traveling by yourself or in a group, especially when time, efficiency, and reliability matter. The good news is we have a plan. This is the cover page for the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail Network Master Plan that was developed over three years. It was adopted in 2013. Uh, it includes in this how we can use the rail corridor. And this plan allows for a trail from Davenport to Watsonville and preservation of the track for some future transit use. So the good news is we have a plan. That plan includes a trail. So let's talk about the trail for just a minute. The trail is going to be alongside the tracks. Uh, we'll have space for people to walk and bike and uh, whatever they need to do. Uh, and there'll be a, a transit at some point in the future, uh, some kind of passenger uh, transit service, public transit. How wide is that trail? That trail is planned to be uh, have a paved width of at least 12 feet. <coughs> How does that stack up to other trails in our community? Uh, many of you may be familiar with the Arana Gulch Trail. It uh, has a paved width of 8 feet. The Wilder Ranch Trail that heads out from West Side Sandy to the Wilder has a paved width of eight feet. The Watsonville Slough Network Trail, I don't know if you're any from South County, wonderful network of trails through the sloughs, paved width, eight feet. The San Lorenzo River Levee, some of you may live in downtown Santa Cruz will be familiar with the Levee Trail. It's about 10 feet, it varies a lot, it's from about nine to about 11, but I'd say on average it's about 10 feet. The Coastal Trail, 12 feet. It's wider than any of the trails in our county. It's uh, about 50% wider than most trails. And wherever we can make it 16, it'll be 16. So it's a, a nice wide trail. So let's just review real quickly the trail. 
It's the widest paved trail in the county. Can you step a little bit more to the side here? So oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it'll be a dance. I can do it. Uh, it serves. It serves everybody. Anybody who wants to be on it can, can use it. Uh, staying with the leaving the tracks in place will, is the fastest way to get a trail. Oh, you want to do okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, the wonderful news is the trail is 100% funded with Measure D. You know, a couple years ago we agreed to tax ourselves. We can get we can get this done. It has a master plan that uh, that cover sheet. This uh, master plan is uh, already approved. It's been approved by every city the trail runs through. It's been approved by the county. It's been approved by the Regional Transportation Commission. It's been approved by the Coastal Commission. Eleven miles of this trail is currently underway. The first segment of this trail is going to open this summer in Westside Sand Cruz. <laughs> And we can complete the entire trail in 10 years. One end of the county, the other. This is well within the realm of possibility. So, the trail's great, but it doesn't really address our congestion problem. It doesn't really deal with getting around the county in other ways. We can get, we can get some thousands of users, hopefully, on it. But we still have a, a, trans, a congestion problem. So, what are our choices? We can expand Highway 1. That's not a very popular choice in the county. Or we could add light rail transit to the, to the existing rail line. Both of these approaches are pretty expensive. Uh, but HOV lanes are about four times the cost of rail. So if we were to add HOV lanes to Highway 1, we'd spend about four times as much. So that's a problem. But the other part of that problem is, where do you get the money? So the money is coming from Caltrans. That's who the, the state is going to fund highway expansion, the state's going to fund railway expansion. And Caltrans has decided that they are going to stop funding highway expansion and start funding railway expansion. Ah. I'm going to talk about that plan a little bit later. It's called the state rail plan. Um, yeah. HOV. I'm sorry. High occupancy vehicle lane. That would be a, a lane that you could use for carpooling, could be used for a bus rapid transit system. Uh, they're usually dedicated lanes, diamond lanes. <coughs> if you go over the Bay Area, you see them on any of the freeways there. Um, so, HOV lanes about 600 million is the current cost estimate. Light rail is about three, 130 million. We can round it off to 150 million, just big round numbers. Let's compare that to other things that cost. So, what what is the auxiliary lane project? Now, if you remember Measure D, we were going to fund three and a half miles of auxiliary lanes. That was $100 million. So you can think about auxiliary lanes or you can think about rail service. They're, they're not that much different in cost. So keeping the tracks is smart. Is that going? Yeah, Oh, sorry. We've not done this before. So let's talk a little bit about modern rail. What does modern rail look like? So. Uh, I see a lot of gray hair in the room. I've been here a long time. I remember, I remember when the uh, the trains used to run up to Davenport. They they, they would uh, take coal up, they bring cement down, and uh, those those are uh, that's what I call old rail. That's a freight locomotive. They weighed about 215 tons. Each one of those cars about 150 tons. They were noisy. They had loud horns. Modern rail is not like that at all. Light rail vehicles are about 15 percent of the weight of a freight locomotive. Uh, typically, uh, with the state rail plan, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, electric power, they are literally whisper quiet, you know. Um, currently, they have quiet zone crossings, so instead of the horn, uh, you hear a ding, 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 and uh, it's, really, it's not unpleasant at all. Um, modern rail, I, what, I would, what I would take away from here is just think quiet, very quiet, kind of like an electric car kind of thing. <laughs> An example of a, of a modern rail system, that, not electric, this is a diesel multiple unit, it's a diesel powered electric generator, uh, was just constructed and opened up in Sonoma Marin area, it's called the Sonoma Marin Area Rec Rail Transit, it's just north of San Francisco, often referred to as a smart train. It opened on Labor Day last year. Uh, 
they did things a little bit differently up there. <clears throat> they built the rail first, and now they're building the trail. We're going to build the trail first. Do a train later. Um, this this uh, modern rail system. Um, it's going to the next slide. I, I wanna, what I want to talk about is what modern rail looks like. So inside of this, it's pretty spacious. It's pretty comfortable. They have a little a snack cafe thing. You can get a, a cup of coffee and a pastry on your way to work. You can get a cold beer, a glass of wine on your way home. Um, the the profits from this little operation fund a, a, a becoming independent a nonprofit up in that area that uh, serves uh, disabled people. It's about a thousand clients. Uh, they actually have uh, fully ADA compliant uh, bathrooms on board these trains. Uh, the other thing that's cool about these trains is each one of those trains carries 22 bicycles. Uh, and it's proved so popular with cyclists that they're, they're out of room. They're adding, they had to add a third car onto these trains to accommodate the bicycle commuters. So it's just extraordinarily popular and uh, really works well. So that's kind of the smart train. That's not what we're doing here. This is just to give you a sense of what's possible. So let's talk about the state rail plan because this is a game changer. <clears throat> the state rail plan um, was just released. Uh, it's called the 2018 state rail plan. And uh, it, it includes our branch line. So over here on the, on the side here, it's Santa Cruz to Watsonville. That's called the, San, that's called the uh, Santa Cruz branch line. That line is an integral part of the state rail plan. And that's important. So, so I mentioned earlier, the state rail plan is confirms that the state is shifting from highway, highway money to rail. They plan to increase ridership from a current of about 110,000 riders statewide today to 1.3 million. I think I did the math. It's about a factor of 12 or something like that by the year 2040. They're committed to an all-electric rail network to the extent it's feasible. So um, the, the problem with upgrading existing rail, that may take a little longer. Uh, the sentiment is that all new rail would be fully electric. Um, all electric will lead to a lot of greenhouse gas reductions. You know, I, I'm aware, I mean, probably many of you in the room are aware that last Thursday, Monterey Bay Community Power flipped the switch and for all commercial accounts in, in the Tri-County area, they are now 100% carbon-free electricity. Um, yeah. I think the day that it's July 1st, all, re all the residences will be, uh, the, they'll flip the switch and all the residences will be 100% carbon-free. So if we had electric training, it would be powered by community, Monterey Bay Community Power, and it would be 100% carbon-free free fuel. But how are they going to do this? How, how are they going to... How are they going to accomplish this? It's the money. The state rail plan has identified $137 billion to make this happen. That is a lot of money. That's a lot of money. And uh, <clears throat> let's go to Measure D slides here. So the reason that we, one of the reasons we passed Measure D, which was not many people appreciated, but as a civil engineer, I was like, yes, we've got to do this. We're a self-help county. So as a self-help county, we are now a self-help county. That makes us eligible for our fair share of that money. If we weren't a self-help county, we, would, we wouldn't even be able to apply. So now we are. So we can, we can get our hands on some of that money. And that money is, is going to be available with no new taxes. That is being collected from all kinds of different sources across the, United, uh, across the state. And we can uh, access this money, no new taxes. Let's go to the next one. So let's talk about the money. So, I did some math. The state rail plan, if we, if we just take our population of Santa Cruz County, and we divide it by the population of the state, and we multiply it times that $137 billion, we get what's, what we would call our population weighted share of that money. That's $960 million. Wow. That's, the, that's population weighted share of our money, the state rail plan. Besides that, last year, SB1 got signed into law. I don't know if you've heard of SB1. Um, SB1 is generating, uh, I think for the county, it's $17.1 million annually. Started right now. We're, we're beginning to see that money flowing into our county. If we just allocated 20% of that to rail, uh, 
uh, over 22 years, I'm looking at 2040 as the, as the planning horizon. That would generate another $75 million. And Measure D already includes $48 million for rail. So we add that all up, we got over a billion dollars in available funds. I mentioned earlier that um, passenger rail would be about $133 million. Uh, that's, not the, that's not what it's going to cost. They did a, a feasibility study, a bunch of different scenarios. That's kind of in the middle of the pack. Uh, but it does include a contingency. It includes 13 stops from Santa Cruz to Watsonville. Um, so the cap, capital cost, getting that running, $133 million. If we add in the operating cost for 22 years, it's about $174 million. That totals up to $307 million. So let's round it off. Let's just call it $300 million. So we need about $300 million to operate a train for the next 22 years and available to us is about a billion. I think we can do this. I think we can do this. So what's so great about public transit? What's so great about having a dedicated corridor for transit? One thing is uh, fast transit times. So the rail feasibility study looked at this, some smart people who understand how this works. You can get from Capitola Santa Cruz in 16 minutes. Doesn't matter what the traffic's like on Highway 1 or the surface streets. I don't know how long it takes you to get from Capitola Santa Cruz now, it takes me longer than that. One of the, one of the really great things is from Watsonville Santa Cruz. So you may have noticed that there's a lot of people heading up here from uh, Watsonville to go to work every day. It cuts their transit time down 40 minutes. Right now, the people I talk to who live down there, they allocate an hour and a half for that. An hour and a half could be, could be cut in half. And that's now. Imagine what it's going to be like when there's another 35,000 people living here in Santa Cruz, because that's, that's the population increase that's projected for our county between now and 2040. 35,000 people, just to put that in context, there's about a little over 10,000 people living in Capitola. That's about three more Capitolas are going to be somewhere in our county in the next 22 years. Should the slide say minus 40 minutes? Oh, it's a hyphen. Sorry. You said it would cut it for 40 minutes. It's not 40 minutes. It's the 40 minute transit time. Sorry. Sloppy. Uh, thank you. It will take 40 minutes? 40 minutes is the projected time from downtown Watsonville, downtown Santa Cruz. Okay. And how many stops? That's uh, 13 stops. How long does it take Questions later. <laughs> so, what's this going to cost? The rail feasibility study had a projected fare of 250 each way. It's a $5 round trip. Um, all, an all access pa transit pass, that would include a bus pass plus a transit pass. We don't, this is all I'm speculating here, so you know, don't hold me to this. <clears throat> But it would probably be about $100 a month. Right now, you can buy an all-access transit pass for Santa Cruz County, including the 17 Express over to Santa Clara, access to all of the VTA muni buses over in Santa Clara, and access to the VTA light rail system, which serves downtown Santa Jose. It's $145 a month. You can buy that right now. So I think we can, for about $100 a month or so, we can get an all-access pass on our side of the hill. Um, so what, what does that mean? What does that mean? How, how important is that? If you're trying to live here, if you're trying to pay the bills, you can save about $600 a month if you can get rid of your car. AAA figures every year they calculate what costs to own a car. It's about $700 and something dollars a month. I don't know the exact numbers. Um, but if you can ditch your car and take transit, you can save a lot of money. That's 600 bucks when your rent is... You tell me how much you pay. <laughs> so, uh, Kersha mentioned BMT. So one of the reasons we're a big fan of, of transit on the corridor, and I'm, I'm using rail here, but it could be, you know, whatever, remember, BRT, whatever. Um, it's really great at reducing BMT. So a trail only, you, you know, so many people are going to use it. The average bike ride's about three miles. So you multiply, whatever you think the number of users are going to be by three, and you end up with, you know, whatever you think that number's going to be. Let's say it's 7,000 uh, 7, miles to be ridden on bicycles every day instead of on, in a car. If you add rail to that mix, you've got the 7,000 people on bicycles. Remember, we've got a trail and a, and, a, and a transit. And let's just say they're traveling about 10 miles, right? It's about 10 miles from uh, Aptos to Santa Cruz, about... 20 from Watsonville to Santa Cruz. But anyway, you, you know, do some rounding, 
figure there's 7,000 people jumping on there, you got 7,000 people, you got about 70,000 people on the, on the train or on the transit. So you got about 77,000 can be uh, vehicle miles reduced, vehicle miles traveled reduction with rail plus rail only about seven trail only. So it's about 10 times better. That's uh, significant because that's directly linked to traffic congestion, it's directly linked to greenhouse gas emissions and global warming. What about the quality of life? <coughs> Need to get to work on time? Want to get rid of your car? Want to reduce your total cost of living? So this is the housing transportation nexus. This is the, the nut, and I think uh, Rick's uh, going to spend a little time on this at his uh, transportation justice conference. Uh, but those are the two biggest costs of any, any household. Housing, transportation. So bringing those down is going to make, make this place a little more affordable for families. And... Now let's skip this one. I was really good. I meant to delete this one. Um, we can go back to it if we need to. Um, might be a good way to answer some questions. Uh, so why uh, why stay the course? Why you know why not go with trail only? So trail only has three really big problems. I'll touch on. First of all, trail only is going to is going to greatly delay any whatever we're going to do. You're going to have to redo your master plan, redo the EIR. You have to get you know repermitted uh, local, state, federal. Um, probably the most important one here is the California Coastal Commission. The California Coastal Commission recently drafted a letter, sent it to AMBAY. In that letter they said, we want the MBSST built as fast as possible, we want the tracks preserved, and we want rail service to be amplified. They had a bunch of reasons for that, but what you need to understand is the California Coastal Commission is like an immovable object. And if you're trying to do something and they don't want you to do it, you'll never do it. Uh, I think of the Martin's Beach, you know, that famous padlock on the gate, you know. Uh, so also in some costs, you know, if you, uh, if you want to pull up the tracks, you're going to have to pay back the state. They gave us the money to buy the rail line for a rail line. You're going to have to redo everything. Uh, master plans and EIRs, all those things cost money. Then you actually have to take out the tracks and you got to mitigate those hazards. So all those railroad ties are preserved or treated. That rail bed's contaminated with who knows what. All that's going to have to be mitigated. Um, the RTC looked at that a couple years back. They estimated that cost would be at least $32 million. It's a lot of money. There's also some unknown costs. When you talk about taking up track, most of our, uh, not most, but at least a good part of our rail corridor is what's called an easement. So we don't actually own the land. We own the right to have a rail line across the land. Not uncommon. It's uh, most of the railroads in the whole United States were created that way. Up in Seattle, there's a corridor called the East Regional Corridor. It's not too different from the corridor we have. They rail banked their corridor, and they uh, were immediately sued. Uh, I think it was 53 property owners. They settled uh, after a long uh, legal battle for $140 million back in 2014. The lawyer who uh, represented the property owners has a perfect 26 and zero record in these types of litigations, and he now has uh, practices all over the United States. He's ambulance chasing for these things. <clears throat> so, you know, that would be a that's a huge risk that we would have if we uh, decide to tear up our tracks here. Um, they were sued uh, because the easement was extinguished. The easement was granted for the construction and maintenance and operation of a rail service. And when they pulled up the tracks, that effectively you know, eliminated the easement. The easement it was extinguished by that action. And so the property underlying that easement reverts to the property owner. But they didn't, they didn't want to just give it, right? <laughs> Nobody gives it. So they actually had ownership and they had to come back. They had to go back and, and sue for it. Uh, and so they settled. They settled for $140 million. Um, let's go ahead and skip this one. We're, we're running long on time here. Um, the other thing that you got to think about when you, when you talk about the rail with trail or a trail only solution, kind of like the Greenway people fo focus on, um, 
you know, that's half the solution. It's, it's a trail, it's great. But how do we solve the transportation problem? That's left out of their calculation. So, like, so what would it look like if we actually include a, a, all the costs? Uh, if you go to a rail and trail solution, the, the trail costs about the same. We already talked about the rail costs. We, we can add in some operating costs. We end up with about $430 million for rail and trail. Um, the trail only people like to tell you that their trails only have, have as much money, but <clears throat> I don't know how you can build a, a trail that's twice as wide for half as much, but we'll just make it the same. We'll add in that $30 million for track removal. We'll add in, say, $150 million, just round numbers for that litigation problem. Then we'll add in those HOB lanes, which in 2014 were 585, but now at 600 million. And then you got to put something on that HOB lane, so we'll add another 100 million just to maintain it and put something. So now we're up at something around something around a billion dollars to actually address the same transportation problem. That's the next slide. So what's the Unified Corridor Investment Study? How many people here know about the Unified Corridor Investment Study? That's pretty good. Uh, you know, a well-informed audience. So the Regional Transportation Commission is in the middle of a two-year-long study. And, and that's why at the very beginning I said, whatever I say rail, just substitute BRT or whatever else. So they're studying a bunch of things. Now they just recently, you know, they had all these different scenarios. They narrowed it down to four. So I'm just gonna run, run through the four things they're studying. And this is only for the rail corridor. <coughs> they are going to study trail only. So that's a part of the Measure D. We agreed that we should, we should do that, or the RTC agreed to do that. That's one option for the rail corridor. They're going to study that. They're going to compare that to the trail plus passenger rail, <coughs> rail and trail. They're going to compare that to the trail plus the BRT and freight rail only in Watsonville. Can you tell me what BRT is again? I'm sorry. BRT is Bus Rapid Transit. The beauty of a dedicated corridor is you can, you know, you move quickly. You're not, you're not stuck in traffic. One of the problems with our buses now is that they're in the same traffic everybody else is. So you don't get any, there's no advantage to taking the bus. Uh, so a BRT on the corridor would be an option that would provide comparable performance to a rail service. They're also going to study the trail plus passenger and freight rail uh, across the whole line. The one that's the thing that, that I wanted to just focus on that last um, uh, say that we don't need to go back there, but the beauty of this is that every one of those options includes the trail. So we're getting the trail. Uh, there's no question we're getting the trail. It's going to be great. So just to summarize, let's, uh, you know, trail with transit represents a bigger, better vision for our corridor. It gets us our coastal trail sooner, not later. It will serve everyone, the many, not just the few, 